The Left Hand Path Once upon a time I walked the left hand path. I sought to elevate my soul through knowledge and enlightenment. I wanted to awaken the divine within me, leveraging the God-gifted soul to become my own goddess. I hated God when God delivered me from evil. For a long time, I did not want to believe that evil exists. Evil was relegated to fictionalized horror movies, which I avidly watched growing up. Texas Chainsaw, The Hills Have Eyes, American Horror Story, Ad Infinitum, and The Others. Turns out The Others is embedded within all of us. We all have a shadow to fight, and oftentimes the only way to fight our shadows is if we meet our twin flames and we shadow spar with them. Mm -hmm. Then how would my worthy opponents precisely define when the left that they stand for has gone too far? You didn't like equity, equality of outcome, I think that's a great marker. But if you have a better suggestion, and, and won't sidestep the question, so let's figure out how I can dispense with my white privilege, and so that you can tell me when the left has gone too far, since they clearly can. And that's what this debate is about, about political correctness. It's about the left going too far. And I think it's gone too far in many ways, and I'd like to figure out exactly how and when so the reasonable left could make its ascendance again and we could quit all this nonsense. But Goldberg's case was the left hemisphere is specialized for what you know how to do, and the right hemisphere is specialized for response to what's unknown. And that maps onto this order chaos dimension that the right hemisphere is concerned with reaction to anomaly. And so, so what happens in some sense is something unexpected happens, that's the domain of chaos. And that stops you in your tracks, it freezes you, and that's a predator response, a prey response actually. You're frozen. The unknown has manifested itself. You're not in order anymore. So you freeze, and then you cautiously start to explore, and then it's imagistic. You start making imaginal representations metaphoric representations, dramatic representations of what might constitute the unknown. And then those representations are practiced and implemented in the world and they become more and more fine-grained and automatized and as that happens the locale that they're represented in in the brain shifts from right to left. I do believe that this is the activation point of transformation or like mainstream media would like to call getting triggered by how someone is being or what someone is saying. Triggers are what hits the subconscious nerves. It awakens the shadow that slumbers, hiding behind consciousness, and it doesn't like to be disturbed nor found out. The fundamental low resolution um, grand narrative that we've oriented ourselves around in the West is one of the sovereignty of the individual, and it's predicated on the idea that all things considered the best way for me to interact with someone else is individual to individual and to react to that person as if they're both um, part of the process, because that's the right way of thinking about it, the psychological process by which things we don't understand can yet be explored and by things that aren't properly organized in our society can be yet set right. The reason we're valuable as individuals, both with regards to our rights and responsibilities, is because that's our essential purpose and that's our nobility and that's our function. Dispense with the idea of free will. How is it you organize your relationship to yourself, your interactions with your family, and your relationships with the broader social community? It's a very complicated issue. So I believe strongly that we have free will, that we're responsible for our choices. Those choices are constrained in many, many ways. So there's a chaos within that can manifest itself, that can disrupt whatever order you are. Um, and you know that in minor ways because everybody's always running around doing things that aren't good for them that they know they shouldn't do and that they can't control. And so there's a chaotic and an orderly aspect to everything, to the individual, to the family, to the social world, to the natural world. It's chaos and order at every level of analysis simultaneously. The world, you look at the world with a set of presuppositions. I outlined that in chapter 10 in, in, rules, in 12 Rules for Life called Be Precise in Your Speech. It, it indicates that when you look at the world, you look at it through a value structure. You can't help that because you're always aiming at something in the world and you're always aiming at something you want and you're trying to get it. And so that means that you look at the world through a value structure. Now the question is whether or not that value structure is valid. 
And that's a very complicated question. Okay, so how do you know if it's valid? Number one, you lay it out and you act it out. You, you implement it perceptually and then you act it out. And if you get what you wanted, what the theory predicted, that's another way of thinking about it, but wanted is a better way of thinking about it, then the fact that that behavioral routine and perceptual structure produced the intended result validates it as a tool for obtaining that result. And that's a form of truth. Now, it might be the only form of truth, although I'm not convinced of that completely, but it might be. It's a very complicated question. And so if you immerse yourself in meaning, you can learn to do that. You can learn to do that. You can make that goal your highest goal. And so then the highest goal would be to be the sort of mythological hero, let's say, to embody and incarnate and imitate the mythological hero, like the imitation of Christ, which is what you're called to do if you happen to be Christian. That means that you live in meaning, and that meaning is the antidote to the suffering of life that would otherwise make you brutal and vengeful and unhappy and miserable and like that, that young guy who just mowed down 12 people in Toronto. These are real things. You lose your sense of meaning. You end up in hell. And in hell, you do all sorts of terrible things. These are, these are dreadful realities. And it isn't as if they're not grounded in the appropriate science. Make no mistake, these are parasites. I tried ending my life in 2013 to get rid of the parasite in my mind that's telling me these awful things. People hate you, just die. God hates you, etc., etc. But here's the good news in the spiritual battle. God, the Alpha and the Omega, the Good Father and His Good Shepherd, His Word made flesh, Jesus Christ, can deliver you from the parasite. At least while we're alive, the parasite isn't going away, but at least you have the tools to battle the parasite. My role is to play my character in the realm of empty and meaningless, whilst shaping this character from the absence into the presence of love. See the devils in the details. As we know in the book of Genesis, the serpent only added one word, not, to a whole entire command. For on the day you eat of the fruit, you shall surely die. The serpent added one word, not. So it is when it comes to manipulation. Manipulation is often cunning, baffling, and powerful. That postmodernism was a way for the Marxists to keep going under a new guise. I suggested that Marxism was fundamentally based on hatred rather than sympathy and, and empathy. I suggested that the corpses were the, the evidence for that. Um, I told you why I think postmodernism is fundamentally wrong. Um, but now I want to talk to you a little bit about white privilege. So, the first thing that I, and I haven't got this quite figured out yet, I can't quite figure out why the postmodernists have made the canonical distinctions they've made. Race, ethnicity, sexual proclivity, sexual gender identity, let's say. Those are four dimensions along which people vary. But there's a very large number of dimensions along which people vary, right? In fact, given that there's an infinite number of ways of interpreting the world, you could immediately point out that there's an infinite number of dimensions along which people vary. And so then the postmodern question is, why would you privilege some of those dimensions over the other? And I would say, well, because it sustains your bloody Marxist interpretation, that's why. But you're not going to say that because it marginalizes, right? You've marginalized that so you can ignore it. So that's one of the fun things about postmodernism. You can, you can, I have a very vulgar image in my mind, but, <laughs> but <laughs> I won't share that with you, but you can infer it. Here's some ways people differ. Intelligence, temperament, geography, historical time. You live now and not a hundred years ago. Attractiveness, that's a, big, that's a big one. That's a big one. Would you, imagine you, you could, we won't, we won't go there either. <laughs> Youth, you, it's, it's advantageous to be young. You've got potential. It's advantageous to be old. You've got wealth. Health, that's a good one. Sex. Women have advantages. Men have advantages. Maybe one has more than the other. It's not self-evident. Women live about eight years longer. They're multi-orgasmic. <laughs> <clears throat> Athleticism, wealth, family structure, friendship, education. 
Well, then there's the classic, you know, postmodern ones, race, ethnicity, etc. Why not those other ver dimensions of variation? There's no evidence that they're less important. In fact, there's quite a bit of evidence that they're more important. So, like, why not consider them? Then you get intersectionality. This is one of the things that's really comical, I think, because the postmodernist identity politics types actually realized this. They thought, well, okay, race and gender. Fair enough. Well, what if you're what if you're a black woman? Well, that's a problem because, well, now you've got two dimensions of differentiation. What the hell are we going to do about that? And what if you're what if you're gay and black and female? Well, then what if you're not very bright and gay and black and female? <laughs> and then what if you're ugly and not very bright and gay and black and female? And like you can keep playing that game. You can keep playing that game an infinite number of ways, because there's an infinite number of ways to categorize things, as the postmodernists already pointed out. And so the intersectionality theorists came along to plug the hole, but they don't know where they're going. They don't understand that the logical conclusion of intersectionality is individuality. Because there's so many different ways of categorizing people's advantages and disadvantages that if you take that all the way out to the end, you say, well, the individual is the ultimate minority. And that's exactly right, and that's exactly what the West discovered. And, you know, the intersectionalists will get there if they don't kill everyone first. <laughs> of living within your culture. So let's say you live in your culture. You're privileged as a member of that culture. Well, obviously, that's what the culture is for. That's what it's for. Why would you bother building the damn thing if it didn't accrue benefits to you? Now, you might say, well, one of the consequences is that it accrues fewer benefits to those who aren't in the culture. Yeah, but you can't immediately associate that with race. You can't just do that, say it's white privilege. It's, there's many things it could be. It certainly could be wealth, and the intersectional people have already figured out that there's many things it could be. So, like, what the hell? Seriously, well, what's going on? Well, we let these pseudo-disciplines into the university because we're stupid and guilty, <laughs> seriously. And they have no methodological requirements, and plenty of power, and plenty of time to produce nonsensical research, and produce like resentful activists, and now we're bearing the fruits of that. It's not pretty. So white privilege. Well, the other thing you might notice is that to attribute to the individuals of a community the attributes of that community on the basis of their racial identity is called racism. That's what racism is. There's no other way of defining it. It's attributing to the individual the characteristics of the group as if the group was homogenous. Now, the intersectional people have already decided that's not a fair game because there's so many differences between people. But the postmodernists don't care about logical coherence because they regard logical coherence, here it comes again, as a creation of the white European male patriarchal structure that's designed to oppress the oppressed. And that's technically the case. So logical incoherence, it doesn't matter. And you could say, well, if you act out your logically incoherent ideas in the world, you're going to run face first into a brick wall. And the postmodern answer to that is, there's actually no real world. It's all interpretation. So there's no, there's no having that discussion, but the postmodernists don't care, because they don't believe that discussion between people of different power groups is possible anyways. So here we are. Well, so I made a case tonight, you know, I'll go over it. What's the case? The postmodernists are wrong. They're philosophically naive. They're right about an infinite number of interpretations and wrong about a finite number of viable interpretations. And that's like, that's, that's death. That's the end of postmodernist theory. And that's not the only way in which they're wrong. They're wrong in a bunch of other ways, but they're more subsidiary. The Marxists, they're not just wrong, they're wrong and murderous, or wrong, murderous, and genocidal, unless you think murderous and genocidal doesn't mean wrong. And you, you can think that. There's lots of would-be revolutionaries who would be happy to have blood running in the street if they had their chance for revenge and the opportunity to move up the hierarchy of tyranny. So you, can, you, you don't have to think that murder and genocide is wrong, especially if the right people are murdered and genocided, right? That's actually part of the, part of the whole equation. But if you're willing to think that murder and genocide on a mass scale across many cultures over many decades is wrong, then Marxism is wrong. And the postmodernists don't get to just come along and adopt Marxism. 
as a matter of sleight of hand because their Marxist theory didn't work out and they figured out a rationalization. They don't get to get away with that because it's too dangerous. It's too dangerous to the rest of us. And we don't, and it isn't necessary for us who are trying with the small part of our hearts that might be oriented towards the good to allow people who are manipulating us with historical ignorance and philosophical sleight of hand to render us so goddamn guilty about what our ancestors may or may not have done so that we allow our shame and our guilt to be, to be used as tools to manipulate us into accepting a future that we do not want to have. Elusive. A lot of times, I'm not even aware when I'm being manipulative. That's how cunning and deceptive it is. One thing I do know is that in order for all of us to catch each other in our act of manipulation, we must work together. We must work together and forgive each other every day, every second. We have to kill all others. We have to break our commitment to higher power. You think I'm stupid? is based on the, a short story called The Hanging Stranger by Philip K. Dick. And the thing I was excited about was this ability to talk about collective unconsciousness, like collective blindness. And so with his character, he kind of takes us into this world and, you know, first we question the madness of the world and by the end we question whether or not he's mad. It said to kill all others in giant letters. And that's some sort of crime or something? I mean... Very dangerous. Dee did um, shift the short story from a sort of alien invasion to something political. I think it is a commentary on today's um, politics. When I first read the script, I thought, wow, this is so current and, and so timely. I think all of us feel like Filbert to some degree. You know, we just want to shake something. And it's unpolitical. This is exactly what I've been saying all along. We'll get into all of this, folks, after the break. Say nothing. When the candidate says that phrase, um, I think to determine who the others are. If you are a sane member of society who trusts that government really just is looking out for everybody's best interest, you will just let things go in one ear and out the other and chalk it off to hyperbole. And if you are an other, then you will listen too closely and thus have to be dealt with. If you are not another, then you have nothing to worry about. Are you an other? Gilbert, you know, is in this maddening scenario where everyone is arguing like the wrong point. No one is responding to kill all others. People are spinning off on free speech. Or, well, what does he really mean by that? Everyone is afraid of speaking out because they are afraid of themselves being labeled. This episode is, is a beautiful reminder that you gotta beat the drum for justice. For now I understand that not one single human being on this earth is perfect in love. We all have slips. Some of us have slips and falls. But in the end, we are all delivered. I know that in these Matrix games, there's two truths and a lie. And it's our job to help each other spot the lie in somebody else's statements, in somebody else's thinking process. Don't think we should underestimate how much this feeling is prevalent in the culture of <laughs> this strange paradox that the liberals are illiberal in their demand for liberality. They are exclusive in their demand for inclusivity. They are homogenous in their demand for heterogeneity. They are somehow undiverse in their call for diversity. You can be diverse but not diverse in your opinions and in your language and in your behavior. And that's a terrible pity.
the people don't think through what freedom of speech means because they tend to think it means the right to criticize those who are in power, for example, which is one of the things it means. But freedom of speech actually means the freedom to formulate ideas badly and awkwardly in public while you're trying to think them through. And Including if, offending people? Well, it's inevitable that you're going to offend people if you're going to talk about anything difficult, because if you talk about something difficult, then people are going to become emotionally involved. And that's especially true if you talk to large numbers of people about something difficult. Like if I address an audience of a thousand people about anything vaguely contentious, which is obviously yeah. something that needs to yeah. be thought about, then the small percentage of them are going to be offended. I went to a program called Landmark Forum. They gave you 99% of the truth. The punchline at the end of the three days is that life is empty and meaningless, and it's empty and meaningless that it's empty and meaningless, so you create the meaning. Two truths and the lie. It's true that life is empty and meaningless at the crux of this matrix game, but it is not empty and meaningless that it's empty and meaningless. The point of living is loving. I don't think the fundamental problem is that people don't have enough money. I think the fundamental problem is that human beings in some sense are beasts of burden. And if they're not given, if they're not provided with a place where they can accept social responsibility, social and individual responsibility in an honorable manner, they degenerate and die. That's the opiate crisis in mm. the West right now. Like men need men who, who are men don't need money they need function so I would even go so far as to add life is empty and meaningless and it's empty and meaningless that it's empty and meaningless except for love love is the only true meaning and it is defined tribal population against population mayhem that we were talking about at the beginning of this conversation that when people have the sense that the the burst of growth that they were experiencing is now over, the natural response is to turn on those who are not as powerful and take their stuff. That this is a totally indefensible, but nonetheless biological pattern of history. And that if we want to avoid that, we have to stop sending the signals that trigger us to imagine that we've just run to the limit of the opportunity that we had discovered, and it is now time to look and see who can't defend their position. How are we sending these signals? Well, by um, basically n failing to provide enough well-being that people's perception of the inequality is reduced to a tolerable level. Well, That's the argument for universal ba basic income, it's right? It's certainly, certainly a strong one, and I, right. you know, um, it's also an, it's also a good argument for equality of opportunity, right? Because people are people are actually not as resentful about the success of others as you might expect. They're resentful about it if they feel that the game is fixed. Mm. But they're also willing to consider the game long term. So lots of people will say, "Look, like I'm stuck at not zero. I'm stuck at one. But my kids might make it to four, and that's good enough." And that's been the American dream, right? And and that's and that's a really high power antidote to inequality. It's like, well, yeah, there's some inequality. We need it to keep the generative mechanism going, but the game is fair and you can play it too. And there's some reasonable probability that either you or someone you love will be successful. So th that, so it has to be a straight game. And that's why ethics is so important to keep this landscape stable. People can't play crooked games and the rich shouldn't be fixing the game if they want to hold on to their money. And the problem is, is that some of them, although not all, some of them are fixing the game. And no one's happy about that. And no wonder, you know, and, and I guess that was evidenced to some degree by the 2008 collapse because it seemed, and, and I'm just as uninformed as the next person, so I'm, I'm what, I'm, I'm capable of commenting on this. It seems from the outside that the rich disproportionately benefited from the restabilization of the economic system. And people are not happy about that. And they shouldn't be happy about that because it indicates that there's something fundamentally rotten about the game. So you could say, well, maybe people can tolerate necessary inequality if the game isn't rigged. And so that's why everybody has to act in a manner that indicates that the game isn't rigged. And that means they can't rig it. That's really what it means. So, and so we're also being driven into this inequality corner by, I would say, by the postmodernists and the neo-Marxists because they say this is the pernicious thing. They say, well, 
The reason that some people have more than others is because every hierarchy is based on arbitrary power, and they're all oppressors. And the reason they have the money is because they stole it from you. And there's some truth in that because there are some criminals. But when you get to the point where you fail to distinguish the productive people from the criminals, which is exactly what happened in the 1920s in the Soviet Union, you better bloody well wa watch out because when you radically make things egalitarian, you're going to wipe out all your productive people and then you're going to starve. And so that's, that's one of the doom end scenarios that awaits us if this idiot process of polarization continues. And what I find reprehensible about the universities, and you're tangled up right up to your neck in this, is that the universities are actively agitating to produce people who believe that all inequality is due to oppression and power. And that's just, well, first of all, it's technically wrong. But, no, but it's why dangerous. is that, though? You guys both operate in that system. So what? Well, it, here's the problem. No, I, as far as I know, nobody has properly studied the question of what fraction of the economy is actually crooked, rent-seeking, right? Not productive. And I fear that the answer to that question is that it's an awful large fraction of the economy, not because of some uh, conspiracy, but because opportunity is finite, but con games aren't. And so anybody who can find a mechanism for transferring wealth from somebody else for doing nothing finds that mechanism. And that thing is, is ever present. Whereas discovering the next big thing that's actually productive is, you know, something that goes along and fits and starts. And so if we were, I mean, really, you've, you've described it very well. We've got a battle between two caricatures of what's true, right? Are there, either the market is wonderful and it's producing great stuff with very little corruption or everything that makes people unequal is the result of corruption. Both of these things are wrong, right? Markets are marvelous engines for figuring out how to do something really well. They're brilliant at this, right? And so people who see that fall in love with it, understandably, because they're so good at it. But what they're terrible at is telling you what you should want or what you should do, right? If people tell markets, here's what we would like to accomplish, and then the markets tell us, well, how do we accomplish that best? That would be a very viable system that would not result in massive rent-seeking, resulting in everybody feeling that all of their misfortunes are the result of a rigged game, which is so massively rigged that when they check, they see, yes, that is actually lar large, to a large extent what we're suffering from. Um, but they want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, and so they want to throw out markets entirely, which you know, it would be a terrible mistake. Just like an algorithm, and that algorithm is constantly being tested. The algorithm of love is one. The algorithm of everything else is zero, empty and meaningless. For a while, I was walking the left hand without even realizing, well, half realizing that I was walking the left hand. I was curious. I wanted to see how deep the tunnel, the rabbit hole, will go. It, the reason's supposed to be self-evident, Joe. Oh, okay. you know, well, so l let's give this argument its due. I mean, I, I don't buy this argument, but um, but nonetheless, let's let's not uh, let's not caricature it. Yes, that's good. Um, in a, an absolutely free market, which is not what we have, but we have something that tends uh, in that direction. In an absolutely free market, if you compete two individuals, one of whom is completely amoral, will embrace any opportunity if it makes a profit, no matter what it is, and the other individual has some limit to what they will do. Well, then there's no question who wins. If we give this experiment a long enough period, the individual who will do anything will outcompete the individual with moral limits because... Doesn't it depend on what the game is, though? Because no. if people find out that you have no moral limits, then they're going to remove themselves from your market. Unfortunately not. And no? here, here's the. I know it seems like that, and in, in, in any given round, that's true. Okay. But to the extent that what you're saying is to the extent that people police... Um, they're purchasing and they will, you know, they will stop using Uber if Uber is ethically uh, compromised, for right. example. Um, well, then the point is, well, what's the game? The game is to figure out which things are being monitored and not do any of the unethical things that are being monitored, but to do all of the unethical things that aren't being monitored. And so the individual who is perceiving 
which things they can get away with has an advantage. That's and, the psychopath advantage, right? Well, I don't even want to call it the psychopath advantage, right? What this is, is that a market will train you to do this if it is unregulated. And the best that the ethically, that the ethically um, restrained person can do is compete dead even. They have no way of getting ahead because the person that is completely free, the, the amoral uh, business actor, has the ability to do anything that the constrained actor has. Doesn't this depend entirely upon what the battlefield is? Not really. There's, there's sort of one exception, and that exception is people who have done something uh, that has suddenly put them in a powerful position, right? So, um, like tech want, people. Right. Tech people who have skyrocketed as a result of having innovated the next big thing right. have not been through the markets training them to discover the the landscape of what isn't being monitored that you can make a profit at. That's they, one of the fascinating things about tech people in general is that these gigantic tech corporations almost all lean left. Well, the gigantic tech corporations lean left. That's true. On the other hand, I mean, I hate to say it, but think about how Google started, right? Don't, don't be evil. Right. I think they actually meant that. Right. Right? And the thing is, don't be evil is what it sounds like when you haven't been trained by the market to have to do whatever you have to do to beat your competition. You've just come up with the great search engine and suddenly you're on top of the world. Um, but over time, what happens? That entity is now exposed to competition from a bunch of other entities that increasingly will find an advantage in being freer to do e ethically questionable stuff. And mm. so what it does is it forces an entity like Google to evolve in the direction of amorality. So now don't be evil. It kind of happened evil. with China and Google. You know, yeah. Because Google wanted to expand into China. And so, you know, they had to make a deal with the devil, so to speak. Right. And they, they had to accept censorship. They will find ways to rationalize everything because to not rationalize that which their competitors can avail themselves of would be to perish. And and one so, of the issues was uh, there was all sorts of fake Google going on, uh, just like they have fake Apple stores in China. They don't have the same sort of copyright laws that we have, and you can essentially plagiarize anything you want. And Brett, you, you also said that I shouldn't make a straw man of the anti-business argument of my peers. And there's another way that I shouldn't make a straw man of it. Like... Despite the fact that I'm not anti-capitalist, I don't believe that every entity is a business either. And one of the things that has happened to universities that has actually they pathologized in a number of dimensions, but they've also pathologized along the business dimension as the administrators have become increasingly trained or drawn from the ranks of business managers. Because a university is actually not a business. It's a, like a church isn't a business. There are organizations that aren't businesses that you can't just cram into the free market structure willy-nilly. And so my colleagues also object to the, to the transformation of the university into a business entity run by profit-seeking MBAs. And they should object to that because that's not what the institution is for. So there are reasons for them to be skeptical, say, of my association with the business school that aren't merely a reflection of a simplistic anti-capitalist ideology. Oh, there are lots, so, of, there are lots of things that um, are not, have no immunity to contact with the market, right? What has happened to the university system is that markets have pushed it in all kinds of directions that are not healthy for the mission of the academy. Um, and this is also true, you know, journalism isn't well done in a market either, right? It, journalism done in a market ends up telling you what you want to hear, not what you need to know. Right. Um, so anyway, markets are wonderful, but there's certain things they shouldn't be allowed to touch, and there are certain things that they shouldn't do, like tell us what to want, right? Not, there's no magic principle by which a market knows what's healthy and what, you know, you might crave yeah, and but so shouldn't that, have. Well, that also then brings us back to another part of the conservative um, liberal left dilemma, which is, well, you know, to direct the market means to impose the heavy hand of the state and its potential pathologies on the market, but to leave it alone completely means that it wanders randomly through a through an indeterminate landscape. And, and I guess part of the issue there, too, is it, it's sort of like, well, how do we how do we how do we properly balance for, foresight and planning, which you'd think would have some role in, in the construction of large-scale states. It's like, well, what do we want the landscape to look like? How do we balance that with the sort of comprehensive computations that the market allows? And 
Of course, the answer to that is we have political discussions about it all the time that are untrammeled so that we can adjust the ratio between those two things as necessary. So, again, that's a, that's a, re, that's a argument on the side of free speech. Right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. really, it couldn't be more important. The real answer is that both failures are frightening. Right. right? Mm. You really don't want a state uh, nannying you um, and over-regulating the market and taking the magic out of it. And you don't want the completely unregulated landscape where the market, you know, starts probing the minds of your children and figuring out how to sell them things that they don't have any ability to resist. It turns out it's endless, like a infinite karmic, self-fulfilling feedback loop. It just keeps running, 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 without a stop, without any purpose. It just is. And in an age where we have the choice of becoming our own gods, to be worshipped in the game of one-upping, zero-sum, where you get to the top of the pyramid, you find out that it's still empty and meaningless. This is the left-hand path. Because any time that you discuss a disagreement, they already have this notion that says, well, I'm superior, and guess where that leaves you? You're in the low place, and you're not going to change their mind. So just know, going in, that's their game, and uh, it's a game that you don't have to play. Uh, another huge thing that we want to keep in mind is the narcissist lacks empathy. Now, in healthy relationships, it's not as though we're going to have a lack of disagreements, but we are going to have the presence of empathy in healthy relationships. You say what you want to say, and I'm thinking, okay, I, I can buy into that. And then I say what I want you to know, and then uh, you say in reverse, hmm, that makes sense. Coming from you, I, I'll uh, give you some respect. The narcissist can't think that way. If you think, well, maybe if I say things this way, then they're going to show some understanding. Mm, that didn't work. Okay, maybe if I try this, then they'll show some understanding. Well, that didn't work either. And if you continue in your arguing, uh, hoping that this is going to be the day that I'm going to get that person to understand me, you're going to be waiting for a long time because that's not in their skill set. They don't want to understand you. They don't feel the need to understand you, keeping in mind that they're extremely dismissive. So keep that in mind as you go into a disagreement. Now, uh, another thought that you want to hold on to is the narcissist hates the notion that you feel competent within yourself. Because they're over there with a very critical mindset because criticism is one of their primary ingredients. They're thinking, you don't know anything. You're an idiot. You, uh, you, you reason poorly. Uh, anything that you think, say, and do that's, uh, that strays from me, is, it's probably off base anyway. And so if you think that, uh, uh, that they're going to actually um, respect the fact that you feel confident and competent, think again because they will not. And then uh, that also leads to another thought, and that is um, uh, keep in mind that as you do engage with the narcissist, one of their goals is to keep you off balance. Now, they can do all sorts of communication techniques with you. For example, they'll ask cornering questions like, where did you come up with an idea like that? Or who told you that? Or don't you remember I, I said that something to you last week? Are you just an idiot or what? Do you just not listen well? They'll, they'll ask you questions like that. And you'll notice that when those questions are asked, <laughs> they're not being asked for the purpose of becoming enlightened. They're not being asked because they're wanting to have information. It, it, I say it's a cornering kind of question because the question is an attempt to make you feel foolish. Keeping in mind that one of the, the primary elements that's on the inside of the narcissist is a shame-based way of thinking. Chances are they were spoken to in a shaming way when they were growing up, or they certainly witnessed it a lot, and then that becomes the language that they use when they're engaging with you. So let's keep in mind that the narcissist has this kind of mindset that I just described pretty much every time. And if you think that it's your goal or it's your uh, need to make that person respond differently to you, then you, you've already lost. Still, why do we walk the left hand? What is there to explore? Well, why does the woman keep searching for the lost coin? Why? Does the shepherd 
leave his 99 to find the one? Why does the father celebrate when his rebellious son finally comes back home? Love is indeed a mystery, isn't it? Change your mind I'm up all night You got my blessing Can't decide what's wrong or right Hold on tight It's all I'm asking Time ain't easy On us We will never know Where we'll end up I will fall away You go Good old but you step up And you're far right in Feeling like it's you who's been chosen I'm not part of that circle anymore. This, this is different for me. No, but it was that forgiveness moment that allowed him to go, okay, I'm good. You guys got my back? Yeah, all right, we're good. We're going to go out and we're going to help people now. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses understanding, will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Stop listening for a plan when the storm is out of your control. It's not that God doesn't have one. He does. The point of you being still is that he's not. He just doesn't need you to worry about weighing in on or help execute the plan he's got it covered. So you just receive the word, peace. Where is the storm? Because the storm is only in one of two places. It's either external or it is internal. The storm is beyond you or the storm is within you. Let's make it practical. The storm is either out of your control or it's happening in here. And you can either choose to engage with it or ignore it. Where is the storm? In Mark chapter 4, Jesus is with his disciples and they're in a boat, they're sailing across the Sea of Galilee, which they did quite frequently. And on this particular day, the scriptures say that a windstorm picked up and it caused the water to become violent. In fact, the water was so violent that the scriptures let us know that the disciples are actually afraid they're going to die. Now, considering that a good portion of these guys were professional fishermen who spent a great deal of their lives in boats on the Sea of Galilee and had seen their fair share of storms, their fear lets us know that this storm was the real deal. That that water was very violent. It was three enemy armies conspiring to destroy you kind of violent. And where is Jesus in this moment? Verse 38 lets us know that, that Jesus, he's in the stern. He's in the back of the boat, asleep. 
on a cushion. So not only is Jesus sleeping, Jesus is sleeping comfortably. He's like cushion level sleeping. Like is the cushion getting wet? Does Jesus care? I don't know. These are the questions that go through my mind. Jesus is asleep. The disciples, they're freaking out. They are panicking because they're thinking we're going to die. So they go over to Jesus and they shake Jesus. They wake Jesus up. Jesus, wake up. Do you not know that we're perishing? Jesus gets up, wipes the sleep from his eyes, tells the storm to stop, and it does. And then he asks his disciples a question. He says, have you still no faith? And you've got to grab a hold of that. That's a really important moment. Because the point of that question is not if you have enough faith, you can control the weather. That's not the point. Jesus is God and he possesses authority over creation that you and I do not. I can't even get my dog to sit. So I've got no authority over creation. The point of the question is not if you have enough faith, you can control the weather. The point of the question is if you have enough faith, the weather won't control you. And that's exactly what was being communicated to the disciples in that moment. The fact that Jesus was choosing to sleep in the middle of the storm should have told them, you know what, we can be cool, calm, and collected right now. He said we're going to the other side, so the other side is where we're going to go. And we don't need to be panicking. But because they do panic, they go to Jesus and they're like, hey, what's the plan? What are we going to do? We're perishing. And the thing that they missed, the reason that Jesus had to tell the wind and the waves, peace, be still, is because they didn't recognize that that was the word for them before it was ever the word for the storm. They're looking for a plan. We want to know, like, yo, this is threat level three, Jesus. What exactly do you want me to be doing in this circumstance? Well, judging by the fact that he's sleeping... I'm going to go out on a limb and say he probably just wants you to to be still. To let him speak his peace to you in that circumstance. But we don't do that. When the storm is external, and this is an external storm, to be seeking a plan in that moment is silly. Because there's nothing God could tell them to do that they would be able to execute at all. There's literally nothing they can do in that moment to make the storm go away themselves. So for them to be seeking that is silly, but that's what we do in external storms. We go to God and say, hey, what's the plan when you lose the job, when somebody is hurting you, when there's an external storm going on in your life? We go to God and say, hey, what's the plan? Tell me what to do. And when you don't get a plan, you think that God has gone silent on you. And so what you usually do is you invent your own plan. You call it God's plan. You execute the plan, which crashes and burns because you're not a very good planner. And then God gets bad PR because you told everybody in your circle that God gave you the plan in response to the storm that you were facing. Meanwhile, it all could have been avoided if you just took a moment to step back and go, where is the storm? Oh, it's beyond me, which means that God must be speaking his peace to me. So take a page out of Jesus' book. Take a nap. Get some sleep. Psalm 127 and verse 2. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. They were asleep because they were looking for relief from the storm on the inside of them. And that storm... As much as it was a lot lesser than the storm that was going on in Jesus, it still got the best of them. Because the storm in Jesus led them to pray and get locked in with God's plan. But the storm in them led them to go to sleep so that they can get relief from that storm. It's ironic, you know, because the last great storm they went through with Jesus, he rebuked them for not sleeping. But now in this storm, he rebuked them for sleeping. Because there's some moments where you've got to recognize that God is actually not speaking his peace to me right now. This is a moment where I must st- my spine needs to become steel like the Holy Spirit on the inside of me standing up to help me face off with my future and know that God is leading me into his perfect plan. But if you're only listening for peace, you'll think that God has gone quiet on you. But he hasn't. He's just having a different conversation. Could it be possible that the thing you are seeking peace for, peace from, is not actually anxiety. It's the stirring of the Holy Spirit in you to say now is not a time for you to seek 
relief from what you feel. Because if you really take stock of your life, things are going pretty well. So maybe the storm is not beyond me. Maybe the storm is within me. And God is actually wanting to lead me into the next stage, the next chapter, the next step of his plan for my life. Stop trying to quench the spirit of God on the inside of you to lead you into his good and perfect plan. And get ears to hear.